Hi everybody and welcome back to Electrified Veronica and our EV conversion series. We're converting a 99 Jeep Wrangler into all electric for a year now. And for those who have followed the project along so far, you can see that we have a major update since the last video where the Jeep was basically a rolling chassis and we were just installing power brakes, power steering and the acceleration pedal. We were working nonstop to get the Jeep ready for the SEMA show that happened last November in Las Vegas. We actually had our first prototype ready, but the Jeep was not up and running. We had the batteries installed and all the main components were there, but not everything was hooked up and connected. We learned a lot during this first prototype build. We had a few challenges and also we have a couple ideas to make this build better. So in this video, I want to walk through what we did since the last video and why we actually probably redesigned the entire battery and thermal management system. In the last video, we were installing power brakes, power steering and the acceleration pedal. And look what the Jeep looks like now. A lot has happened since the last time. So let's get started with some cleaning and upgrades that we did. So we cleaned the body, which was actually in a pretty good shape. We removed the rust and made it all look nice and shiny again for some coating. We also cleaned all the vents and all the components in the dashboard. They were pretty dusty and it looked like an animal had lived in there at some point in time. As you can see, we sprayed the interior with um, a bed liner. You can also see that the big hole that we had in one of the last videos where you could see the electric motor is basically gone. So Darren from Performance Off-Road, he made a really nice cover that we put on when we're going for drives. But the nice thing is we can also remove this and really show the technology behind whenever we go to shows or any kind of other demonstrations. We also got really nice Carhartt seat covers from Covercraft. And as you can see at the moment, we have a soft top on it. Why a soft top in the middle of the winter, you might ask. This is basically to give it the look and feel from the Gilmore Girls show. But of course we have a hard top whenever we don't pretend to be part of that show. We also upgraded the stock suspension with a two inch lift kit from TerraFlex. We got new brakes and also super fancy tires and wheels for our off-roading adventure. As you can see, the entire frame is cleaned and spray painted and it looks really, really nice again. I really want to thank the whole team from Performance Off-Road Wisconsin for their hard work to get the Jeep ready for the SEMA show. Okay, so let's have a look at our battery box or everything that's left of it right now. But I swear it was filled with batteries at some point in time. Let's look at the last status of the beautiful cat design that we shared in our videos. The idea was having four battery modules in the front battery box and then two separate smaller modules in the rear where the gas tank used to be. We upgraded this first design a little bit to also include the battery management system, the contactors and the thermal management. We also realized that in the back underneath the gas tank, there is not enough clearance if we have both modules on top of each other. So we decided to put one of them, one of the rear modules in the cargo space area. This is not our preferred solution and we might get rid of this module entirely, but we're still investigating this. Building the battery boxes was fairly simple. So we decided to use eighth inch thick aluminum sheets. Oh, it's not, a, not a full sheet. It's not long. You ready? Clear. Done. Done. And just simply use angle pieces and rivets to hold everything together. It was good for a quick prototype build, but for the final box, we'll probably weld the entire system because you really want this box to be completely waterproof. A quick side note, so this box was not designed to structurally hold all the weight of the modules. For that, we actually designed a separate cage from steel that would surround the outside. 
And as you can see, we finally powder coated all the boxes in frog green. What a beautiful color. At the same time we built the battery boxes, we of course started to think about how would we mount the boxes in the Jeep. Let's start with the front battery box. So for the front battery box, we actually reused the mounts for the engine. So Darren from Performance Off-Road built us a really nice tray right here. And what you can see is actually already a little bit of the redesign, but we want to talk about this later. So you can see that this piece here is missing. You can also see the electric motor right there, right? And on the underside of our battery box, we had the onboard charger and everything would be protected by a skid plate. Now for the rear battery module where the gas tank used to be, we also just reused the mounts that were already there and we had this steel plate made and simply bolted it up. And then finally for the second box, Oop, ta -da! Darren made this super fancy construction here. But overall, like I said, we're not so sure if we really want to have a second battery module back here. For all the boxes and mounts, we used rubber isolators to reduce the vibrations that we have on the batteries. Okay, so far so good. Let's get into the challenging part of our prototype build. We of course needed to fill the boxes here with our batteries. We needed to build the high voltage system, we needed to make the bus bar connections and add the thermal management, so cooling and heating plate. You probably remember that we are reusing LG pouch modules from a crashed Mustang Mach-E. We disassembled all those modules into the individual battery cells. We tested them and we paired them according to their capacity and uh, the state of health. And then we built new modules a little bit bigger than the stock modules with higher voltage by just connecting those slices in series. I actually went into all the details of how we built those battery modules in a prior video. But honestly, I need to tell you, it is so much work doing this for many more cells and many more modules. It really took us such a long time. It's a lot of effort. So if you can avoid making your own batteries and just use existing ones. Okay, this is green, this shows colors, this is on, oh my gosh, I'm happy. I want to give you one update from this video, which is really important. We realized that when we made more modules and also started disassembling some of them and it's related to the temperature sensors that we used to measure three temperatures per module. So we used the temperature sensors that came along with the AEM battery management system, but we realized that these sensors are quite thick for pouch cells and actually leave imprints. So they actually locally squeeze the electrodes together. And this is what you really want to avoid in pouch cells because of safety reasons. So what we did is we are reusing these thin temperature sensors that came along with of the stock Mustang Mac E modules. Just a little tip for you. Now, after we had all the modules ready, we started assembling our front battery box and we ran into two major challenges. 
We followed our design, two modules on the bottom flipped over so you can see the cooling fins kind of pointing up, followed by a cooling plate and two more modules on top. We wired all the BMS satellites and we tried to find a way how to stack those very, very heavy modules without hurting ourselves or the batteries. We bought rods where we could slide uh, the modules and then also kind of lift it with those. And you know, overall it worked somehow and we finally got everything into the box, but connecting the individual modules into a high voltage system was really, really challenging. The space was very tight, so making the bus bar connections between the modules, especially with the cooling plate in between, was tricky. Another challenge was definitely the cooling and heating plate itself. We looked into many different options, but we kind of wanted to find a solution that is cheap and also easy to make at home. We thought it's a good idea to use a copper tube, bend it and then stack it in between two aluminum plates. But then of course it was also very challenging to get the cooling plate inside of the box, but still have access to the inlet and the outlet. So altogether we built a battery box, but not everything was working. And at that time we did not connect a high voltage system and we also didn't do any plumbing. And at the moment we're trying to figure out what we can do better. If you have any ideas, let me know. And we're even thinking about really redesigning the entire battery system and thermal management to make this assembly step easier for us. And just a little remark, in all the footage you could see, we never had a high voltage system up and running. And this is why we're not wearing the high voltage gloves yet. So we already talked a little bit about the cooling and heating plate for the batteries, but let's get more into the plans for our thermal management. We will have two separate thermal loops in our electric Jeep. One will be for the battery and the onboard charger and one will be for the electric motor and for the inverter. For the cooling part, we have two mini radiators from Durali and we mount them right where the original radiator used to be. Then we bought two cooling pumps to circulate the coolant through our systems. And this is the battery heater. So in the winter time, when it's cold, we want to do some preheating and then we let the coolant flow through this heater from a Tesla. While whenever we need them cooled down, we would redirect the flow through the radiator. And all of this is controlled by the VCU in the AEM system. And to redirect the cooling flow, we're using this um, three-way valve also from a Tesla. Finally, to heat the humans in the cabin, <laughs> we decided to also use a Tesla PTC heater like this one, which we will put in place of the stock heater core. Okay, so what about all the accessories and the components that run on our 12 volt starter battery, which you still have in an electric car? In an EV, you still have a low voltage system to power the lights, the radio, the vehicle communication unit, the battery management system. And it's also the system that wakes up your high voltage battery when you want to charge it. We started a little bit off the 12 volt uh, wiring. We need to do that all from scratch. We actually got the wiring harness from Quickwire. That's a local company here in Wisconsin. And we'll have a dedicated video with all the details coming up soon, where we're showing the entire wiring diagram and the logic. What I can show you already now is that we updated our lights to LED lights from XK Glow. So we did this with the front headlights and the fog lights, as well as the rear and the brake lights. See, we got the lights in. Only took us only how long? Two hours? <laughs> no, that was long. <laughs> Then obviously, as you can see, the dash is back inside where the most challenging part was actually finding all the right screws again. So just a little tip, try to label everything you disassemble because you will not remember it. So we have a new radio with a nice screen which needed a little bit of modification to fit in.
We have the AEM display mounted right here and the keypad will be mounted right here next to the steering wheel and we're right now 3D printing a new holder for it. Now the coolest thing about the new dashboard is a customized gauge cluster, which you cannot see right now, but here it is. So we got that from blackcatcustom.com and the cool thing about it is you can completely customize it. So you can choose the colors, you can choose the labels of whatever you want to show there. So in our case, we chose the battery power, including the regenerative braking where you feed power back into the battery. So this will be very cool to see. And then on the right side, the battery and e-drive temperature. Of course, what you then also need to do is you have to manipulate the stock gauge cluster and make the communication to the vehicle control unit to really show the right values here. For this, we have an Edgar <laughs> and he is actually right now working on that again. More details coming up soon. Okay, now finally the charge port is installed. Woohoo! So for this first conversion, we decided to only do AC charging, so no DC fast charging. So we would simply charge from a level two charger at home overnight, or of course we can also go to a public level two AC charger. Because it's only AC charging, the cable running from the charge port to the onboard charger is surprisingly thin. The cable runs underneath the car to the charger that sits underneath our front battery box and converts this AC power into DC power to finally charge the batteries. This is pretty much everything that happened since our last video. Like I said, we ran into a couple of challenges with our battery system and the thermal management. We're right now looking into new ideas and solutions to kind of fix this problem. And we're even thinking of designing a completely new battery system where the bus port connections are way easier and maybe we want to reuse existing cooling and heating plates instead of creating our own ones. I'm really curious what you think about our latest updates and please let me know if you have any new ideas for us what we could do better to improve this overall situation. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time. Stay electrified. Bye.